On this Saturday night, Canadian cities sweltering. The summer scorcher sweeping through the prairies and western Ontario while some regions of B.C. burned. We've been through this last year and it's bringing up lots of anxiety. And parts of Europe deal with an unrelenting heat wave that's claimed hundreds of lives. Plus, passport problems persist. The lineup outside the passport office was all around the mall and almost outside the door. Why the feds feel they can fix the backlog as time runs out for families waiting to travel. Soldier saved. Why this Ukrainian woman whose mother was shot dead helped rescue a Russian fighter. And from chuck wagon controversy. This is kind of interesting. I've never been at a weekday powwow. To increased inclusivity and sold out shows. The biggest party of the summer heads into its final weekend. Global National with Bara Nasser. Reporting tonight, Nithu Garcha. Good evening and thanks for joining us. Many Canadians are seeking out air conditioning this weekend as temperatures have climbed into the 30s, prompting Environment Canada to issue heat warnings for large parts of Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba and Ontario. While in B.C., the forest fire situation has quickly escalated, homes have been destroyed and a number of evacuation orders are now in place. Abigail Beeman reports on the impact of the first major heat wave of the summer and what we can expect over the coming weeks. Everybody stressed. It's stress. Um, yeah. We've been through this last year and it's bringing up lots of anxiety. A year after fire destroyed Lytton, B.C., dozens there are under an evacuation order trying to do what they can to process the repeat threat. We can bring water, we can bring meals to the firefighters. You know, they're going to be working 12, 14, 16 hour days here. The fire is still out of control, but there is positive news. The reports are from the ground or that the fire activity overnight was quite minimal, um, so there's limited growth. The worry now, next week's climbing temperatures. A northern Manitoba First Nation is facing evacuations too, with the administration trying to help families via Facebook. We were the last group that left Pagadawagan. We followed the railroad tracks all the way to the park. And then we were all put up in either the Power Cranberry in a gymnasium. Much of Manitoba and Saskatchewan, as well as southern Alberta and northern Ontario, are under heat warnings from Environment Canada, with some daytime highs as hot as 36 degrees Celsius and Humidex values close to 40. In some areas, there's no reprieve for three days. We found that our ice cream sandwiches were kind of starting to heat up and melt a little bit, so we had to put a hold on those. Well, relief from the heat is expected across the prairies in the coming days, but that comes with a cold front, the moisture needed with showers and thunderstorms, but not the lightning and wind, and there could also be more storms around Lytton this weekend too. And in regions with no heat warnings, like the nation's capital, people were still looking for ways to beat the heat. This and ice cream. <laughs> Staying hydrated and um, make sure I put on some sunscreen. It, honestly, it's not as bad as the first time I worked here. I think I'm just used to it now. Environment Canada predicts we won't see as much deadly heat this summer as in 2021, but expects we will see summers like that one more often in the years to come. And even if things don't get as hot this summer, nearly the entire country is expected to see temperatures higher than normal, except B.C. Abigail Beeman, Global News, Ottawa. A heat wave sweeping across Europe is being blamed for more than 300 deaths. Thousands of people have been forced to leave their homes as firefighters try to control the flames. The fires are stretching from the central parts of Spain out to the southwest of France. Temperatures in Portugal have soared above 46 degrees Celsius and tomorrow is forecast to be even hotter. The British government is holding an emergency meeting ahead of those record high temperatures expected to hit next week. For the first time, a red warning has been issued, saying the extreme heat may pose a risk to healthy people and could cause serious illness or even death. The alert covers most of England for Monday and Tuesday when temperatures are forecast to climb above 40 degrees. The area of high pressure currently sitting over the UK will progressively move east across north central Europe and reach the northern Balkans by the middle of next week. This will result in high temperatures for much of western central Europe. 
Rail systems are being advised to halt travel during peak heat hours, while care homes are being told to take extra precautions to protect the elderly. As the travel restrictions fell away, the desire of Canadians to travel took off. From April 1st to the end of June, Service Canada received more than 808,000 applications for passports. That surge in demand has led to a massive backlog, with many Canadians wondering if they'll have their documents in time to travel. Shalima Maharaj has the latest. We were told originally maybe four to six weeks we'd have the passports. We hadn't heard anything prompting Oshawa, Ontario resident Chris Vale to pay a visit to his local passport office. I went in at about 6.15 in the morning, only to figure out that the lineup outside the passport office was all around the mall and almost outside the door. I was about 200 people deep. The passport is for their one-year-old daughter. They're heading east to see family for the first time in a long time, and we're planning on detouring through the states. It wasn't until nine weeks after he and his wife started the process that they were finally able to get some answers. To her credit, she was able to stick with it and then she was finally able to, uh, to get through. Vale says his wife was informed that until that moment, their application had never even been looked at. I sent it off registered mail on May 20th. Uh, the government received it May 25th. My credit card was charged June 15th for the $257 processing fees. And now at this point, I have no idea what's going on. Time is running out for Calgary resident Trevor Boudreau, who booked a trip to South Carolina so his girls could spend time with their grandfather. I haven't even received a response to uh, my request for a status update at this point. Canadians under 16 traveling to the U.S. by land or sea are allowed to present an original copy of their birth certificate, something Boudreaux and many other Canadians mailed in to get their children's passports renewed. I thought I was being responsible by giving them, you know, between the third week of May to the end of the first week of August. Families Minister Karina Gould says she remains confident the backlog can be dealt with in four to six weeks. We're also working on a notification system um, that hopefully will be rolling out in the next week or so. To keep people who've provided their contact details in the loop on its progress. Gould says if your travel is not urgent, visit your local Service Canada. If it is, meaning you're leaving in the next week or so, Bring your proof of travel with you. So if that is uh, an airline ticket, if you're traveling by air, if you're traveling by land, it can be a hotel reservation that you have in the United States, um, and go to that passport office. As for Chris Vale, his daughter's passport is now on track to being ready for pickup next week. It's just being able to finally go on this trip, go see some family after so long and being closed off from so many people and the people we love. It's just, uh, it's a blessing for us. Shalima Maharaj, Global News, Toronto. U.S. President Joe Biden has wrapped up his four-day visit to the Middle East with assurances America won't neglect the region while so much focus has shifted to Russia's war against Ukraine. With U.S. gas prices reaching record highs, Biden also came away with promises for more Mideast oil production to help combat ballooning inflation. Jennifer Johnson has more. After meetings with the leaders of Egypt, Iraq and the United Arab Emirates, U.S. President Joe Biden pledged a stronger relationship with the Middle East as other superpower nations threaten regions throughout the world. But the United States is going to remain an active, engaged partner in the Middle East. We will not walk away and leave a vacuum to be filled by China, Russia or Iran. The president's visit to Saudi Arabia has drawn harsh criticism from Republicans and the widow of former Washington Post columnist Jamal Khashoggi, who was a frequent critic of the kingdom. Biden met with Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, who U.S. intelligence concluded was behind Khashoggi's murder. When you're president, you got to deal with people you don't like as well as people you do like. And we have an alignment of interest. Biden did send a direct message to the crown prince and others in the region, stressing the importance of human rights and freedom of speech. The future will be won by the countries that unleash the full potential of their populations, where citizens can question and criticize their leaders without fear of reprisal. Biden and the kingdom did negotiate an increase of Saudi oil production. The U.S. has seen the highest gas prices in history since the president took office, hitting Americans hard. I had planned to travel in uh, the northern part of the United States this year, but can't do it with the fuel prices. 
prices have decreased slightly over the past two weeks, and the president says the Saudis' increased production will further help lower costs in another few weeks. But that's not soon enough for many Americans. It's incredibly sad to say, oh, look, at it. it's only 559 over here, and we're excited about it. With inflation hitting a 40-year high back home, Biden made his first Middle East visit as president. The White House is looking for a win as polls show Biden's job approval numbers continue to plummet. Disagreements over the war in Ukraine kept the G20 finance ministers from issuing their usual formal communique when they wrapped up a series of meetings in Indonesia. The ministers are urging all countries to take urgent action to tackle inflation and address the growing global food insecurity crisis. The unresolved COVID-19 pandemic as well as the unfolding war in Ukraine are likely to exacerbate the already severe 2022 acute food insecurity that we are all already seeing. The G20 includes Western countries like Canada that have imposed sanctions on Russia and accuse it of war crimes in Ukraine, as well as nations like China, India and South Africa, which have been more muted in their responses to the invasion. The U.S. and Russian space agencies have struck a deal to fly each other's astronauts to the International Space Station. The news comes as an unmanned SpaceX Dragon capsule docked with the station, delivering more than 2,600 kilograms of supplies to the multinational crew in orbit. The agreement will allow for an American astronaut to travel to the station with two Russian cosmonauts aboard a Russian Soyuz rocket in September, while another Russian will be aboard a SpaceX launch that same month with two Americans and a Japanese astronaut. Coming up, a Ukrainian woman's survival story and how she saved a Russian soldier. Russian forces keeping up their barrage of artillery and missile attacks, targeting civilian infrastructure in eastern Ukrainian cities. Overnight, this commercial warehouse in the key port city of Odessa was hit by rockets which set the building on fire. Kyiv says Moscow has been intensifying attacks on civilian targets far from the front line, a claim the Kremlin has repeatedly denied. We are in the fifth month of Russia's attack on Ukraine, and since the invasion began, time and time again, civilians have been the targets of horrifying attacks and atrocities. In the early days of the invasion, Russian soldiers were ordered to fire on civilians traveling on a roadway, but one of the women who was shot at survived. She's alive because some soldiers didn't follow through on the order to kill, and in turn, she saved a Russian soldier's life when he got shot. Sean O'Shea reports from Ukraine. The war here in Ukraine has lasted more than four months, but back in February, on its first day, Karolina Perlofon came face to face with death. That's when Russian soldiers on a roadway in eastern Ukraine opened fire on the car she was in with her mother, Irina. Her 51-year-old mother was wounded, hit by a bullet in the head. She died there on the spot. Karolina was her only child. In those minutes, Karolina thought she was dead too, recording and later posting this video to Instagram, thanking her parents for giving her life. You can hear the gunfire in the background. But Karolina survived the roadside attack, partly because two Russian soldiers, including this man, refused to carry out their orders to kill Ukrainians there on the spot. The lieutenant colonel gave the order to shoot civilians, this soldier told Ukrainian interrogators after his capture. Authorities shared the video with Karolina. She's still processing what happened that day. Those soldiers could have killed you at that time, couldn't they? Instead, the young soldiers were soon hit by gunfire. One died, and this soldier was injured. He was bleeding and couldn't walk. Then perhaps an even more remarkable act than the soldier's decision not to kill. As her mother lay dead from a Russian bullet, Karolina drove the young Russian soldier to safety. Why did you do that? Mm -hmm. I had a choice. Taking the soldier 10 minutes away to get medical attention. 
She realized he survived when she saw the interrogation video. He would have died, she told us. I wouldn't have been able to live, and I know I had a chance to save him. He's a human. He didn't do anything to me. The 29-year-old lawyer who lost her mother to Russians who targeted civilians still coping with her loss and confident she did what was right. Sean O'Shea, Global News, near Kharkiv, Ukraine. A tumultuous week in Sri Lanka has ended with the country's parliament accepting the resignation of the president from exile overseas. The streets of Colombo are now calm after months of protests over runaway inflation, shortages of basic goods and government corruption boiled over this week with people storming government buildings and the presidential palace and causing Gotabaya Rajapaksa to flee. A new president will be chosen next week, a fresh start that Sri Lankans are hoping will begin the process of easing the island's economic process and rebuild trust in its shattered politics. Ahead, cutting back costs while increasing your income. Expert tips on navigating soaring inflation. The Bank of Canada surprised economists with a 1% key interest rate hike amid soaring inflation, which has many Canadians reconsidering their spending habits. With a look at some practical tactics and strategies households can take on to navigate the next few months of cutbacks and uncertainty, financial counselor Pamela George is joining us now. So Pamela, what's your advice to those who are panicking over the possibility they might not be able to afford their mortgage? My advice, first of all, is to take a breath, <laughs> calm down, don't panic, and um, don't try to do it by yourself. It's not a DIY situation right now. Seek professional help. Now, there could be more interest increases this year. How are you preparing clients to plan ahead for the higher cost of living? Well, the fact that we know there's going to be more interest rates increases, I think it's a good thing in the sense that they have given us a heads up. So it's a good time to look at your budget, look and see where you can decrease some costs, eliminate some altogether if you have to. It's not going to be forever, but look at your budget, reduce what you can, put it aside for when those increased rates come back, maybe in a couple months, late, late in the year, that type of thing. What about those on fixed incomes? How can they manage household costs with runaway inflation? Well, you know, fixed income, that's what it is. But I feel we can always look at ways to find something on the side to do. Yes, you bring in, you know, $4,000 a month. However, there are things you can do. Let's say your, your expenses are up $500 a month because of all these increased prices. Well, that's $125 a week. Find a side gig, find something that you can do to bring in that money. And it's not just finding employment. It might be that you have a skill. You have some talent that you can look into and start bringing in. You know, start a small business, a gig. Put something on Etsy and sell it. I've seen that happen with my clients and it works. Regardless of financial situation and debt, what are some overall strategies around spending less or even earning more that you'd recommend right now? Well, you know, it, I always say times like this, you need to look at your budget, but having a mindset of I am going to make this happen. There's nothing that will change this right now, but there's a, I feel there's a lot we can still do and a lot we still have in our control that we could employ in order to see you know, to help us through this, to help us ride the waves. And some of them, like I said, it's increasing income, but it's really looking at it from a, 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 from a way that we can, we can say, okay, at the end of this, I am going to come out of it better, or at least how I went in and not worse. I think just shifting that mindset a little bit is going to help us not go into that sinking mentality and mindset that I'm seeing all over social media right now. Financial counselor Pamela George. Pamela, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Next, the star studded celebrations as the Calgary Stampede rallies a business bounce back. The Calgary Stampede star-studded event wrapping up this weekend. The event, which builds itself as the greatest outdoor show on earth, pulling out all the stops for its post-pandemic protocol return, attracting actors, politicians, and visitors from around the world. As Tracy Nagai reports, the attendance numbers proving it will take more than a pandemic to dampen Calgary's stampede spirit. 
From Hollywood movie stars. It's always nice to be invited anywhere. <laughs> to Wild West rodeos. The stampede once again drawing in tourists from across Canada and around the world, showcasing longtime favorites and new events. I'm from the United States, so this is kind of interesting. I've never been at a weekday powwow. This year's celebration of cowboy culture, highly anticipated following health restrictions and pandemic protocols. We're tracking very close to 2019 attendance levels, which was a fantastic year. The soaring temperatures and prices on the Midway, no match for people wanting to soak it all in. We've had er, an extremely hard year, so especially the last couple months, so it's really yeah. important to just, yeah, to get a day that's like, don't think about it, just go have fun. We were supposed to come in 2020 when it got cancelled, so the trip got pushed back a few years, but we're excited and uh, happy to be out. And the economic benefits are being welcomed by businesses that have struggled over the last few years. Hotels, the restaurants, the attractions, people are out and they are spending money and they're enjoying themselves in the city right now. It's wonderful to see. To have it gone for so long, it definitely felt like there was a void in the city. So when they announced it, it was like, we're ready. We're ready. However, the 10-day event not without controversy, with renewed calls from animal advocacy groups to end the chuck wagon races following the death of a horse despite new safety measures this year. We're still seeing this carnage and we're still seeing another dead horse. We are doing a tremendous amount to help minimize uh, any incidents that might occur, but unfortunately we can't eliminate all risk. With the 2022 Calgary Stampede in the books, the hope the buzz will remain long after the greatest outdoor show on earth is over. Trace Nagai, Global News, Calgary. And that is Global National for this Saturday night. I'm Neetu Garcha. Tonight's Your Canada is Squirrel Cove on Cortez Island in BC. We love seeing your Canada. Please keep emailing your photos to viewers at globalnational.com. Thanks for watching. Have a great night.